All right, so we're going to talk about tomato problems. Um, we're not going to talk about all the different problems tomatoes have. We're just going to kind of touch on some of the the most the ones that we typically encounter. Um, so not an exhaustive presentation, but um, touch on the things that we commonly see. All right, so first off, um, just kind of a little background information on tomatoes here. Um, so tomatoes are Selenum lycopersicum. Um, they used to be uh, lycopersicum esculate escalatinum. Um, so you may see that in some of the older um, references. Um, but these are in the, the Solanaceae family, or they're nightshades. Um, so these are related to potatoes, peppers, um, eggplants, um, some of our different vegetable crops that they're related to. And this can be important when we start talking about some of our disease issues. These plants can share um, some diseases with each other. Uh, if you ever look through a catalog that has tomatoes in there, um, there's hundreds of different varieties available um, that come in all different kinds of sizes, um, from cherry tomatoes to you know, large slicing tomatoes that can get two, three pounds um, when fully grown those fruit. Again, different shapes. Um, you have your round cherry tomatoes. Um, you have um, kind of your grape tomatoes. Your sauce tomatoes are going to be more kind of a, an oval shape. Um, slicing tomatoes, your beefsteak type tomatoes, again, more of an oblong type shape as well. Color, we typically think of tomatoes as red, but they also come in yellow, orange, um, purple. Some varieties will remain green. They don't really color at all when they're ripe. Um, plant types, we'll talk about that. Um, there's a variety of different disease resistance. So if you have issues with particular diseases, um, year in, year out, that may be something to look for as resistant varieties. Um, and then maturity, some can only be, some may be um, some of our more dwarf varieties, 40, 50 days to, to maturity, where others can be 60, 70 plus days before um, you start getting mature fruit on those plants. Uh, tomatoes are a tender, warm season perennial. Um, they don't tolerate cold temperatures, though. So here in the United States, uh, we are typically uh, growing them as annuals, though. Um, down south, and especially when they're in... Um, greenhouses um, and other places, you can see some of these plants getting a year, 18 months, two years old um, if you take care of them well. So they can be long lived if you have the proper environment. Um, and these are the most popular garden vegetable in the United States. Um, something I saw from Arkansas um, says about 90, 90 to 95% of American gardeners um, that have vegetable gardens grow tomatoes in their gardens. So if you have a vegetable garden, it's kind of almost one of those requirements that you have a tomato plant in there. Um, just some terminology when it comes to tomatoes. So we have our heirloom tomatoes and our hybrid tomatoes. So heirloom tomatoes, um, typically define those as varieties that have been passed down through the years um, by saving the seeds from those fruits. Um, and typically those are non-hybrid varieties. Um, so basically you, you eat your fruit, you collect those seeds, you plant it, it comes back true to form. You do this year after year um, and those fruit still come back true to form year after year. You've got kind of a stable, um, some stable genetics there. Um, and if after 40, 50 years of this happening, that those plants are then typically considered an heirloom. Um, then our hybrid tomatoes, um, you get these by crossing specific varieties of tomatoes um, to get that hybrid so they do not come back true to form. So if you were to save the seed from a hybrid tomato, that, that plant that you get next year is not going to be the same as the plant you had previously. Um, so that's kind of one of the main differences between those. Um, and a lot of our more uh, modern um, hybrids are going um, to be determinate type plants. Um, so like everything else out there, there are advantages and disadvantages to both uh, heirloom tomatoes and hybrid tomatoes. Uh, some of the advantages to heirloom tomatoes um, is that stability. Um, so you get, you kind of know what you're getting. You can save those seeds. Um, you can expect to get the same thing um, year after year. Uh, taste, a lot of people consider our heirloom types uh, to be have superior flavor um, compared to some of our more hybrid or more commercially um, bred um, varieties. Um, again, just kind of a general rule of thumb um, on that. Um, there's a lot of individuality to them, um, so you get a lot more unique shapes, um, sizes, colors, um, all of those different things that you don't, you tend not to see um, in a lot of the hybrid types. Um, and you also preserve some of that genetic diversity um, and, and that history. So again, some of these have been passed down for, for decades or hundreds of years. Um, a lot of them have stories 
um, associated them with them. Um, one example would be Mortgage Lifter Tomato. Um, so that was developed by somebody um, in West Virginia. Um, they were able to, by selling these, they were able to pay off the mortgage on their house um, because they created this real desirable type of tomato. So a lot of these have interesting stories that go with them. Um, there are some disadvantages, though. Uh, disease resistance, a lot of times these heirloom types do not have um, as good a disease resistance um, as hybrids do. Again, kind of a general rule of thumb on that. Um, the individuality, while that may be a benefit, depending on your perspective, that can also be um, a drawback. Some people just don't want um, weird, funky-looking tomatoes um, or, or different colored ones. But again, that's kind of individual preference there. Um, and then productivity, um, again, a lot of times our heirlooms take a little bit longer to mature um, and they may produce less fruit uh, than some of our hybrid varieties. Um, our hybrid tomatoes, um, so again, advantages, um, they have that, that productivity um, to them. Um, a lot of times they just, they just kind of grow better, they produce more a lot of times. Um, a lot of times these have been bred for disease resistance, so a lot of times you're going to have uh, more disease resistance available in these hybrid type tomatoes. Um, strength, a lot of times they do a lot better in um, when we have less than ideal conditions. A lot of time, again, just kind of general rule of thumb on that. There's an exception to every rule out there. Um, consistency, um, again, you kind of get that predictable size, color. There's not as much variation within those, those plants sometimes. Um, and then longevity, a lot of times... Um, they, the the fruit lasts longer. Um, they don't go bad as quickly. Um, they're a little tougher. Um, they, they can travel a little bit better. Again, that could be a disadvantage though um, to some people. Um, flavor a lot of times they don't they don't taste as good in a lot of people's opinions compared to hybrid types. Um, sometimes again they have those undesirable traits. So that longevity. Um, maybe you don't want a tomato that you can store in their store for. Um, weeks at a time, whereas, you know, if you're growing these commercially, you want to be able to pick that fruit and then ship it and it still hold up. Um, and then that instability, um, so that if you save those seeds, it's not going to come back true to form. So if you want to save seed, um, hybrid type tomatoes are probably not the route you want to go. Or you're going to get surprised the next year. You don't, you're not going to know what you're going to end up with that following year. Um, so that's just a little bit of the background information on, on tomatoes there, so we're kind of all on the same page. Um, so some of the different pests we have in tomatoes, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but just some of the more common ones. Um, so insects, aphids, whiteflies, flea beetles, hornworms, uh, tomato fruit worms, some of the pests we commonly see. Uh, some of the more common diseases that we see here in Illinois, um, some of our wilts, verticillium, and fusarium, um, our blight diseases, early and late blight, septoria leaf spot, and anthracnose. Um, and then some, some abiotic issues. Um, so our blossom end rot, sun skull, zippering, cat facing, yellow shoulder cracking. Um, these are different things we're going to cover um, in this presentation. Uh, so first off, um, kind of the ABCs of IPM. Um, so when it comes to our, these tomato problems, um, when we're trying to manage these, we want to try to use integrated pest management. So that comprehensive approach to controlling pests, whether those be insects, weeds, pathogens, what have you with environmentally and economically sound practices. So we've got our pest populations. We're gonna use our IPM techniques and we're gonna get those down to a lower, more manageable level, not necessarily completely eliminate them, um, but get them to a point where they're not causing uh, damage to our plants. An important part of IPM, I uh, should have made a separate slide for this, is scouting. So going out into your, into your tomatoes, into your garden, what have you, and looking at those plants and seeing what's going on in the garden. The earlier you catch a lot of these problems, it's going to be a lot easier to control that. Um, if, you, if you don't really ever go out in your plants and all of a sudden your plants are infested with disease or some kind of insect, a lot of times it may be too late to do much about that. Whereas if you would have caught it early, you could have taken some steps and greatly reduced uh, the amount of damage. So go out there at least once a week, um, take a look at your plants, know what they're supposed to look like, and try to look for things that may be um, unusual and, and kind of investigate further and see if it's something that's going to manage or warrant management uh, to them. So the techniques we're going to use, we're going to use cultural management. Um, this is probably the most important one. Um, so with this, we're maintaining our plant health. So that right plant in the right place at the right time. So making sure we're having good fertility. So doing a soil test occasionally to make sure you have uh, proper nutrient levels in the soil. Um, 
using resistant cultivars, particularly when it comes to disease, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, pruning help opening up that canopy in tomato plants. Pruning can be kind of a personal decision when it comes to tomatoes, um, but it can kind of open up that canopy, let airflow get through there, kind of reduce some of the moisture, reduce some of those disease problems. Um, that good sanitation, so getting rid of diseased plant material, in some cases, maybe may getting rid of entire plants. Um, if you're picking caterpillars or something off, disposing of them, not just throwing them on the ground so they can crawl back onto your plants. Um, mulching to help retain soil moisture. This can be important for stuff like blossom end rot. Um, and then water use. So making sure, particularly with tomatoes, you're not getting nice, um, even water um, to them. You don't want to let them really dry out because um, that can cause some issues. Um, and we'll talk about those uh, towards the end. So when it comes to disease resistance, if you've ever looked in a catalog, a seed catalog looking at tomato plants, a lot of times you'll notice um, the names of the plants followed by some letters, um, and oftentimes those are going to indicate resistance to particular diseases. So for tomatoes, uh, typically we'll see A, F, N, T, and V. So A is going to be alternaria, those plants that will have some resistance to alternaria. Um, F, fusarium, N, nematodes, T, tobacco mosaic virus, and V, verticillium. So if you're not, if you haven't really grown tomatoes a lot before, um, I would encourage you to look for disease resistant varieties. If you commonly have problem with particular disease um, in your garden, you may want to look for a variety that is resistant to that and help reduce um, some potential problems right off the bat. Uh, and just because a plant is resistant to a disease does not mean that they are immune. Um, if we have really good conditions for that disease, those plants can still develop it. Maybe a little bit, maybe less likely, they may not get it as bad, but there is still a chance those plants can develop that disease. So it's not a silver bullet. Again, it can can greatly reduce the amount of problems you have, um, potentially. Um, spacing, another um, important cultural thing. We don't really want to pack in our tomato plants um, real tight. Again, that can lead to a lot of moisture um, around and create a good environment for disease. So a lot of this is going to depend on the growth pattern. Is it an indeterminate? Is it a determinant? Um, and your type of culture. So how are you, uh, are you going to be staking these? Are you going to be caging them, trellising them? So there will be some variation there, but in general, our dwarf plants, a lot of times these are marketed as good for growing in pots or in containers, uh, typically 12 inches apart in a row. Um, if you're going to be staking your plants, typically somewhere between 15 and 24 inches apart. Um, if you're trellising, um, 24 to 36 inches apart, so two to three feet. Um, if you have really vigorous and determinate varieties, um, if you have plants that are going to get really large, you may even want to go four feet between plants, five to six feet between rows. A lot of times, if that's not, you're going to be doing much trellising. You're just kind of letting them grow on the ground as a vine. You're going to need a lot of room um, for those plants. Uh, so some of the different ways we can train our tomatoes. So we have our staking. That's that picture on the left there. So basically, you're putting, in this case, um, a wooden post into the ground. Um, typically, stakes typically recommend about seven feet tall, drive those in about a foot into the ground, uh, about four inches from the plant. You want to get those too close to the plant so you're not disturbing that root system, especially if you're putting that in after you plant. Maybe a good idea to put those stakes and then plant your plants so you're not disturbing those plants after they've been kind of established. And then you're going to tie those tomatoes up to those stakes using kind of a, a soft cloth. Um, when I do it, I use old t-shirts, just cut those up and tie those up in a figure eight pattern. Um, onto those stakes to kind of hold them on there. Um, typically when you're staking, um, you're going to kind of select one main stem to the plant and you're going to prune off all of the suckers. Um, a lot of times, again, that can be a little bit of a personal preference on that. Um, our caging, that's going to be on that far right there. So you can see these tomato cages, the types you typically get find in hardware stores, um, nurseries, what have you. Um, a lot of times these can be more productive because you don't necessarily um, remove the suckers from the plants, less sun scald because your fruit aren't getting exposed to the to the sunlight because you're pruning. Um, but because you are leaving all those suckers on, a lot of times the fruit um, will ripen later because that plant is not putting more energy into the fruit where, where you're pruning. If you leave those suckers on, some of that energy is going into that sucker pr um, production um, and not as much into the fruit. Um, Cages are going to be best for the determinate types that don't get real large. If you have indeterminate types, if you've ever tried to cage those with the ones you get 
um, from the store. Those will quickly swallow those cages um, and they don't really do much good. Um, you can construct your own using concrete reinforcement wire um, as an example, make those into a cage. Um, openings ideally should be about six inches by six inches so you can reach your hand in there and you can get the fruit out. Um, I have made some with your kind of your typical um, garden fencing where those holes aren't all that big and we had to cut holes in there in order to get the fruit out and you, you cut up your arms because you have those sharp edges and stuff. So keep that in mind if you're making your own cage. You need to have holes big enough you can get the fruit out of. Um, and then trellising in the middle there, that's kind of a, a hybrid of the two. Um, several different ways you can trellis. Um, with trellising, it's, it's a little more efficient use of your materials. So with staking, you're using one stake per plant. With caging, you're using one cage per plant. Typically with trellising, you're using a stake every two to three plants. Um, so you have less material there. A um, couple of different ways you can do that. You can use the Florida or basket weave. Um, so you're going to take a string and you're going to weave that in between the plants. Um, and you're going to do that several times. You're just going to work your way up the plant as they grow. You're going to keep weaving um, where there's the T-post string trellis. So again, you're putting those, those stakes in the ground. You're suspending a lot of times a two by four from the top and you're dropping strings from that and letting those plants grow up those strings, clipping those plants to that. So that's similar to trellising, whereas your Florida weave is going to be similar to caging. Um, University of Maine has some really good videos, um, five or so minute long videos on how to do some of these different um, tomato training techniques. Um, so if my descriptions didn't make that much sense, I would encourage you to check those out. They do a good job of, of kind of showing you how to set these up. Um, pruning tomatoes. So what exactly are we talking about when we talk about pruning tomatoes? Um, so this is going to be more critical for, for your indeterminate, a lot of times in your determinate. Um, and again, this can be kind of a, a personal choice on this. Um, so for determinate types, typically you prune up to that first fruit cluster and then you stop. Um, indeterminate, some people will prune off all the suckers. So again, you just have that one main stem. So what exactly is that sucker? Um, so you have your stem, you can see on the picture, that stem, that central stem. Um, you have your leaf coming off in between that stem and the leaf is the axle. And then you'll have that sucker coming off in between um, where they meet there. So pinch off those suckers um, is what we're talking about uh, when we're pruning. Um, also for pruning, about a month before uh, the first frost. So here in central Illinois where I'm at, that's typically around October 10th. Um, is usually around our first frost. So that was, this would be kind of mid, early to mid-September. You come in, chop off the top of that plant on your indeterminate plants. That's going to slow that growth and it's going to send more energy um, into um, fruit development and ripening. So if you want to try to kind of speed up that process a little bit at the end of the year so you get more ripe tomatoes to pick, that would be one thing to consider doing as well. Um, our physical or mechanical, so we're trying to physically eliminate pests. So again, cultivating. Um, we talk about hornworms, those will overwinter in the soil, so you can cultivate the soil um, and disturb those pupa and, and kill them potentially. Handpicking caterpillars, um, again, pruning out diseased plant material, um, pulling weeds. Sometimes weeds can um, harbor um, diseases or pests that can be moved into our tomatoes. Um, putting barriers down, so mulch would be a good example. Not only is that going to retain soil moisture, uh, but mulch can also um, help slow down the spread of some diseases that over that can survive in the soil. Um, that rain splash moves those disease onto the leaves. If you put that barrier of mulch down, it can help slow that spread a little bit uh, as well. Uh, our biological control, so we're using um, natural enemies to control our pests. So just because you see an insect in the garden does not necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Uh, so we've got our predators. So we have predatory mite species. That's that mite, reddish mite on the right there. Um, we have uh, lady beetles on the bottom there, so both the larvae and the adult will feed on aphids and other small soft-bodied insects. Um, we get a lot of questions about um, lady beetle larvae. People, they don't look anything like the adults. People aren't sure what they are. They think they're a pest and they kill them. So again, you can see, if you see something like that, you want to leave that in the garden. That's going to do some pest control for you. Um, on the right, we have our aphid lions. Lacewing larvae, again, these are going to feed on small, soft-bodied insects as well. So if you see an insect, make sure you get it identified before you try to kill it. Basically, the moral of the story there. We have our parasites, parasitoids. So we have insects that will lay their eggs inside of other insects um, and eat them. So the picture on the top there, that hornworm. Again, if you get 
tomato, tomato, tobacco, hornworm. This may be something you've seen in your garden. You have all these white things. Those are actually the cocoon of a wasp that has eaten the inside of that caterpillar. So if you see that leave that caterpillar there, you're going to have all kinds of wasps coming out of there that are going to attack other caterpillars for you. Um, and just like people and plants, insects will also get disease. Um, so we've had a real cool, um, wet spring. Um, so that's good for disease development in plants. It's also good disease for disease development um, in insects too. So maybe we'll get a little more, um, some more help from pathogens controlling our insects than we typically would. Um, and then we have, again, we have our chemical management. So we're using pesticides to manage our pests, whether those be insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, what have you. Um, when it comes to using chemicals, if you've ever learned, listened to an extension presentation before, there's always the label is the law. Make sure you read and follow all those label directions. Make sure you can apply that chemical, in our case, to tomatoes. If tomatoes aren't listed on that label or, or vegetable crops, legally you cannot apply that chemical uh, to, to, to that plant, to the tomatoes. All right, so probably the real reason you guys are listening, I'm um, talking about some of these pests, so aphids. Um, aphids get on all kinds of different plants. Tomatoes are no exception to that. There's a lot of different species out there, um, but they all look fairly similar. Small, again, soft-bodied insects, about eighth of an inch or less in size. They kind of have this pear or tear-shaped body to them. They have long legs and antenna, um, and they have two little kind of projections sticking out of the hind end there called cornicles. Um, again, another way you can use, another thing you can use to identify those. Um, they can be green, they can be yellow, they can be black, gray, or red, and depending on that species. Typically, we're going to find them in clusters on succulent new growth on young shoots, uh, I mean leaves. So when you're going out and scouting your, your uh, tomatoes or other landscape plants, um, looking at that new growth, um, that is typically where we're going to find our aphids. So check that out and look for those um, aphid problems. This is another group that will commonly get parasitized by um, some of our parasitoid wasps. So if you find some aphids um, that are kind of papery looking, those have been parasitized. Um, and that's an indication that you may not need to do anything for them. You may have some stuff um, already in your, in your planting, um, working on managing that stuff for you. Um, some other management strategies you can use, a lot of times, a a uh, nice, strong, steady spray of water, knock those insects off the plant. A lot of times that's all you have to do. You may have to do that a couple times, but a lot of times that does a pretty good job of, of getting rid of those. Um, again, encouraging those natural enemies, um, knowing what they look like and not killing those natural enemies. A lot of times, again, they will control your populations for you. Um, and if they get real bad, you can go the pesticide route, but typically um, we don't need to. Uh, white flies, another small insect, so typically we find these on the underside of leaves. Body and the wings of these are covered in a, a kind of white powdery wax, that's how they get their name. Um, so again, these have sucking mouth parts just like aphids, so they'll stick their mouth parts in and they'll suck the juices out of the plants. Um, and this can cause yellowing, cause leaf distortion um, in those plants. In my garden, I typically see these a little bit later in the year. A lot of times when we get into July, August, when it starts getting dry um, and real hot and humid, these populations really start going up. And you may walk into your plants and disturb them, and you see all these little white things flying around. More than likely, you have white flies in there. Um, this is another one, that forceful water spray to knock them off. You may have to do that repeatedly, but a lot of times that can do a pretty good job of managing them. You could place yellow sticky traps near infested foliage. Um, one, you can do that to scout. And two, you can trap some of those insects on there and it can help reduce those populations. Um, the populations get real high. So if you had a situation like that picture on the bottom there, if you've got that many white flies, really in order to, to kind of adequately manage them, you're probably gonna have to again go um, the pesticide route for that. Um, flea beetles, um, this is one that I've seen quite a bit this year um, in my garden, not only on tomatoes, but a variety of different plants, radishes, um, potatoes, um, a lot of different things. Um, kind of, again, small insects, 16th to an eighth of an inch in size, um, again, vary in color. The ones I see are typically um, kind of that black or maybe a bluish color. Um, these have real high, large hind legs. When they're disturbed, they jump kind of like a flea. So if you get real close, you have all these little beetles jumping around. So it's a good bet you've got flea beetles. Uh, and they're going to feed on the, the, the leaves, the cotyledons, so those those things that come out of the ground when the plants are germinating. So 
typically we're not direct seeding tomatoes so you don't have to really about really worry about the cotyledons being fed on but the foliage and stems will feed on um, and you can see that feeding damage there they kind of make these little um, sunken pits um, sometimes the, the centers will fall out so again you kind of get the shot hole effect there looks like somebody shot those plants with a shotgun you have all kinds of little holes throughout that foliage uh, management controlling weeds um, so this is one of those pests where if you have a lot of weeds they can move from those those weedy plants into your more desirable landscape or vegetable crops so keeping uh, weeds down can go a long way um, putting row covers down uh, so when your tomato plants are small before they start blooming you can cover those in row covers um, keep these flea beetles off a lot of other insects off um, and then again um, if populations get real bad in my experience at least in my garden I, I haven't gotten to a point where I've really needed to spray pesticides um, but that is always an option as well um, hornworms uh, so if you've grown tomatoes for a while more than likely you have experienced um, hornworms these are large maybe three plus inch, inches long uh, green caterpillars we have two different types tobacco and tomato hornworm they both do the same damage um, but if you really want to know the difference between them our tobacco hornworm has the diagonal white lines and the red horn on the hind end that is what i typically see whereas tomato hornworm has those eight v-shaped marks um, and they have a, uh, their horns straighter and it's blue on the hind end uh, so if you think of uh, v8 juice has tomatoes in it that's one way to remember tomato hornworms compared to tobacco hornworms um, and these can be um, voracious eaters when they get large kind of these mature um, caterpillars they can they can strip a plant if you have several of them on there um, a lot of times you don't really start seeing them until they get real large because these are camouflaged rather well um, and they don't and until they get real big and start doing a lot of damage you don't really notice them um, like I mentioned with the parasitoids this is one that is commonly parasitized so again if you see a caterpillar like that in the middle there with those white cocoons sticking out of it just leave that in the garden um, those those cocoons those pupa inside of there will hatch out and those wasps will go out and attack um, other hornworms and caterpillars for you if you have kids or grandkids um, these make good pets so a lot of times when I find them in my garden um, we'll pick these off we'll take them inside um, and keep them as pets so when we go out and prune um, our tomato plants we'll take those prunings in take those prunings bring them into the caterpillars and feed them so um, I have also heard that if you eat these they taste like um, green tomatoes personally never done it but um, if you want to go that route let me know um, how they taste our tomato fruit worm um, this is also called corn earworm so depending on what plant it's attacking you have different names um, so in the case of tomatoes um, they're going to burrow in and consume the fruit um, so a lot of times those eggs are going to be laid near the stem where those fruit are attached to the plant so you can see on that bottom picture there those eggs will hatch caterpillars will burrow in uh, to that fruit um, and eat it and when you cut that tomato open you'll get a lot of decay um, it's a lot of black fungal growth in there um, you have the frass or the insect poop in there as as well um, so not something you want to see when you're picking your tomatoes um, they can vary um, in color so they can be green they can be brown yellowish um, they're always going to have these stripes on their body um, fortunately typically we usually see less than five percent of the crop being damaged so a lot of times it doesn't really warrant um, control on it if you're like me usually towards the end of the year you're tired of picking tomatoes so if you lose a few tomatoes here and there really not out all that much especially if you have multiple plants um, if you have late maturing late maturing tomatoes or you got your tomatoes put out um, kind of late um, if you really wanted to spray them you would do that kind of four to ten day intervals um, starting from when those fruit are small to kind of protect them um, from that attack but again typically not too big of an issue um, for kind of earlier in the year when still when uh, corn starts to silk that's again when you would want to start spraying as well or think about spraying when you start having those small fruit on and the silk is when corn is silking and you have small fruit on your tomato plants is when you'd want to spray um, so just briefly some of the different insect pests we find in tomatoes uh, some of the diseases that we have uh, so fusarium and verticillium wilt uh, typically this is going to show up on the lower older leaves they're going to turn yellow and start to wilt um, just quick note that especially as tomato plants get larger that lower canopy starts getting shaded 
um, plants may naturally start to lose those lower leaves. So just because you have um, lower leaves yellowing doesn't necessarily mean you have this particular pathogen. Once those leaves get kind of shaded out, they will lose them. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, this can cause stunting premature death. Uh, so that middle picture there, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see some of those infected plants are much smaller um, than the healthy plants uh, nearby. Um, a lot of times, especially early in the disease development, the wilting really may only occur during stress. So we have, it gets real warm during the day, the plants may start wilting, um, and then they kind of perk up again at, during the evening when it cools off. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean you have these, but it could be an indication that, that you do. Um, we, a lot of times we'll get that brown discoloration of the vascular tissue, so you cut those stems open. Uh, the inside is brown, and I have a picture of that on the next slide, so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, the issue with these pathogens is they can survive in the soil for several years. So this is one reason why we want to do crop rotation. Um, if you get this in the soil, it's going to be there for a while. So you, you really probably shouldn't be growing tomatoes or other um, solanaceous crops in that area for a while. And because it's in the soil, um, it can be spread a variety of different ways. So our infected plant material, um, you know, flowing water, so the those, those spores... Um, we're in that soil, water can move those um, to different areas in the garden. It could be on the seeds, um, dirty tools. Um, so if you're working in the garden, you don't adequately clean um, a shovel or something, you go start digging in a kind of a clean area, there's a potential to transfer that this disease as well. Um, so this is what I'm talking about, for that brown vascular tissue. You cut that open, it's all brown inside. It's a pretty good indication you have um, one of these pathogens. So when it comes to management, again, we talked about those resistant varieties, those F or those V um, abbreviations. So look for this if you have had issues with this in the past. Again, rotating those crops, getting those out of those areas um, where you've grown previously, especially if you had issues with this. Um, avoid wet spots. Again, since these are in the soil, if you have a lot of water there, um, makes it easier for them to get into the plants. It's also going to stress those plants and make them kind of predisposed to getting, having issues um, with disease. Um, if this does show up, you want to destroy those diseased plants, um, pull them, and get as much of that root system as possible, get them out of the garden, um, and you do not want to compost this. Your compost probably is not going to get warm enough to kill this pathogen. This is something um, that you could burn if you're allowed to burn where you live, or put it out in the yard waste. You want to get that out of your landscape um, so it doesn't, there's not, reduce that chance of it kind of surviving and, and infecting other, other areas in your landscape. Um, early blight, um, this is alternaria, so that A abbreviation um, would be resistance to alternaria or early blight. Um, so for this, we get leaf spots. They're kind of round, um, brown, about half inch in diameter. Um, again, typically we find these um, on, on the older foliage near the ground. This pathogen can survive in the soil. Um, so it's in the soil. Um, we get some rain, irrigation, what have you. That rain splash, water splash, can splash that up on the leaves and affect them, and it'll just kind of work its way up the plant from those bottom leaves. Uh, typically, you have these concentric rings or that target pattern uh, on those spots. You can see that really well on that bottom picture uh, on that stem. So if you have these rings on there, more than likely that's going to be early blight. That's kind of typical of our, our alternaria pathogens. Um, leaves, and again, all those stems can be infected as well. I can get these on fruits um, as well. So these are more kind of leathery spots, um, black, and again, have these uh, concentric rings or ridges in those spots. Uh, typically, you see them most often near the stem. Um, and if you have this on the, on the fruit, especially if you have a large area like this picture here, um, that fruit's probably going to drop off that plant. Uh, late blight. Um, this is a Phytophthora disease. So this forms... Um, black, brown lesions on the leaves, stems, and fruits. You can see that on the leaves on the top there and on the, the bottom picture. Um, you can see those that, that kind of brownish, kind of water-soaked damage to those tomatoes. Um, that's typical of our late blight. Um, a lot of times these spots will coalesce or they'll grow together, um, and you can get these large blighted areas, and the, the entire plant can be destroyed, kind of like in that bottom picture there. Um, late blight, this is what caused... Uh, Cause late blight in potatoes, Irish potato famine. This is the same pathogen. So again, these things can infect um, related um, species as well, related vegetable species. Um, septoria leaf spot. This is another pretty common disease we have um, in our tomatoes. Uh, again, usually on the lower leaves, and then kind of work 
um, their way up. They overwinter in um, infected plant debris uh, or in weeds. So again, crop rotation, um, try to grow your tomatoes as far away as possible from where you grew them previously to help reduce some of the chances of getting some of these diseases. Um, spots circular, 16th to a quarter inch, um, brown margins, tan to gray centers. You can see that a little better on that bottom picture there. You can kind of see that dark brown margin um, around that, um, that, that leaf spot there. Uh, if you look real close, a lot of times you can see these kind of little black, um, almost pimple-like structures on those, on those leaf spots. Uh, those are the fruiting bodies of that fungus. So that's what's going to be producing those spores um, that are going to go out and, and infect other plant material. Um, kind of work their way up the plant a lot of times. Uh, leaves turn slightly yellow than brown, um, and then they kind of wither um, and fall off. Um, anthracnose, um, this is one we, we typically see on the fruit, most commonly seen on the fruit. Uh, so we got again circular angular um, sunken lesions. Um, and you can see a lot of times, like a picture on the top there, you kind of get this kind of black, kind of fuzzy growth on there um, that kind of progresses to more of an orange um, or sometimes pink coloring. Again, those are the, that, those fungal structures and that, those spores that are being produced by that fungus. Um, occasionally, you'll see these on the leaves, but again, typically, most commonly an issue on, on the fruit. Um, so how do we manage some of these different diseases, these foliar diseases? Um, so like I have mentioned before, resistant cultivars can go, can go a long way um, in, in kind of preventing or reducing some of these problems right off the bat. Um, there are a few varieties out there um, that offer that kind of that triple resistance um, to our, our early and late blight as well as septoria leaf spot. Um, so Iron Lady um, would be one that's a hybrid variety. It was released in 2013. Um, and then in 2018, another variety called Brandywise um, also has that triple resistance to all three of our, our kind of our big um, foliar diseases in tomatoes. So if you have issues with these, those may be some to look at. Um, again, that crop rotation, um, two to four years, so try not to grow your, your tomatoes in the same spot every year. I know that's easier said than done when you're working in a home garden. A lot of times you don't have a lot of room. Um, but get those tomatoes as far away as possible from where you've grown them previously, especially if you've had issues with disease. Um, if you've had a lot of problems, you may need to take a break for a year or two um, or grow them in pots. Just kind of let those pathogens work their way out of the out of the soil. Um, getting disease-free plants. So when you're purchasing transplants, um, checking them, making sure they don't have any of these leaf spots. Um, they're nice and healthy. You don't want to bring problems into your landscape that you don't have. Um, good air circulation, pretty much all of our fungal diseases, they need kind of that moist, humid environment to really develop well. So that's where we get into that pruning. You can prune out some of those suckers, help open up that canopy, get better airflow in there, help those plants dry out faster. Um, again, make that, that environment less suitable for fungal development. You, know, you want to water in the morning, ideally. Um, in a perfect world, you'd only water in the morning, but you kind of have to water when you can water. Um, but watering in the morning, that allows those plants to dry off during the day. If you water in the evening, that water can kind of sit on there. It may not dry off um, until the following day. So again, creating that favorable environment with a lot of moisture for disease development. Um, again, I mentioned before, mulching. A lot of these pathogens survive in the soil and they will splash up onto leaves, on those lower leaves and work their way up. So if you put it down, uh, mulch provide a, uh, provide a barrier. Um, it can reduce the amount of, of those spores getting up onto your plants. Don't go into the garden if the foliage is wet. So if you have some of these leaf spots um, or these foliar diseases on your plants and the leaves are wet and you're out there working on them, you may pick up some of those spores, transfer those to a kind of a healthy plant leaf um, and then kind of move the, the, the pathogens around that way. So when you're working with your plants, make sure they're dry to reduce the chances of moving those pathogens around. Um, you can also use um, fungicides. Um, pretty much all of our fungicides that we're going to be using are going to be protectants. So they are not going to um, get rid of the problem you have, but they are going to protect the foliage that does not um, is not infected yet. Um, so one way to think about this, um, Travis Cleveland with um, the Pesticide Safety Education Program um, kind of explains it this way. 
I mean, I think it's a good analogy. So it's kind of like putting on sunscreen. If you get sunburned, putting on sunscreen isn't going to do you any good. You have to put that sunscreen on beforehand um, to prevent that sunburn. So fungicides are going to prevent the problems. They're not going to solve them. Um, and again, label is the law. Make sure you're using, um, you're reading and following all those label directions. Um, and since we're going to be applying these tomatoes or food crops, um, you want to make sure you're following those pre-harvest intervals. Um, so a lot of these uh, pesticides will have a, an amount of time you have to wait until you can uh, harvest that fruit off of there after you spray. It may be a day, it may be a week, it may be three weeks. It's going to depend on the product um, that you're using, but make sure you read and follow all those instructions. Um, some of our abiotic or, or kind of disorders that are out there. Um, so one common one is blossom end rot. Um, this is not actually caused by a pathogen, um, but it is an abiotic issue. Um, so kind of a couple different schools of thought as to what causes this. Um, traditionally, have been thought to be caused by low levels of calcium in the fruit. Um, um, some some experiments have been done that have shown that fruits that are in that early stage of blossom end rot have similar calcium levels to healthy fruit. Um, so more and more, it's, it's being thought that it's more of an abiotic stress issue, um, whether that be droughts, um, high light intensity, um, heat, something causing those cells in that fruit to die and causing this, this end rot. Uh, so the picture on the top there, you can kind of see that, that lighter, kind of whitish area on that fruit. That's kind of the, the initial development of blossom end rot in that picture on the bottom. You um, can see that full-blown blossom end rot, that, the end of that fruit. Um, has basically died um, and they kind of turn dark and leathery over time. Um, so ways to prevent blossom end rust, you want to avoid um, excessive fertilization of plants, um, especially using ammonium type fertilizers um, during that early fruiting. Um, providing adequate moisture um, from fruit formation to maturity, uh, again kind of reducing that, that stress. Um, another good reason to use mulch help retain some of that soil moisture. Um, some varieties are going to be less prone to developing blossom end rot for whatever reason than others. So some examples, Celebrity Mountain Pride um, and Cherry Tomatoes typically do not have problems um, with blossom end rot. Um, and if you do think low soil calcium is an issue or why you are having blossom end rot, make sure you're doing a soil test to make sure their calcium is actually deficient. Um, Applying foliar applications of calcium, so spraying that calcium onto the plants doesn't really help much with it. Um, crushing up eggshells, that's not really helping. It's not a long-term uh, fix. Those eggshells have to break down before that calcium can be released. So do this soil test early in the year. Um, so if you do need, for some reason, to add calcium, you can do that and let that get kind of incorporated um, into that soil so the plants can take it up. Um, sun scald, um, so basically your fruit are getting a sunburn, um, occurs when the, the, the fruit are exposed to direct sun during hot weather. So if you get a little, um, go a little crazy on your pruning, all of a sudden you've got fruit that have been kind of in the shade exposed to full sun, um, you may get some sunburn on there. If you have a lot of foliar disease and all of a sudden your, your plants start dropping leaves, those fruits get exposed, um, you can get some sun scald. So. Kind of taking steps to reduce um, leaf spot and the, the chances of plants dropping leaves can kind of help reduce our sun scald. Making sure you have a good healthy canopy to kind of shade those fruit. Um, zippering, so this is when you get those scars running down the fruit. You can see it on the top picture there. And, and kind of an extreme case on the bottom there where that you kind of have the, the, this hole open up in the fruit. Um, basically the flower parts um, kind of stick to that young fruit and as they kind of develop um, kind of cuts into it and you get this scar um, on the plant. Some varieties are more prone to this for whatever reason um, than, um, than others. Um, a lot of times we see this um, more often when we have cool temperatures um, at fruit set. Kind of ideal temperatures for fruit set are 60 to 75 degrees at night, 60 to 90 degrees during the day. So we get a little bit cooler. Um, a lot of times we get um, more zippering. Doesn't really affect, you know, the taste quality of the fruit. It is kind of unsightly. If you're growing these for commercial production, probably not something you want to see, but in your backyard, um, a little zippering isn't really going to hurt your fruit that much. 
Uh, cat facing, another common problem. So again, we get these misshapen fruit. You may see these scars on the bottom, like that top picture there, um, or holes at the bottom of the fruit. Um, several different reasons this can happen. So we have our abnormal flower development. So again, those cool temperatures, um, maybe exposure to herbicides. Uh, tomatoes can be real sensitive to some of our different herbicides that we use. Um, large fruited varieties tend to see this in those a lot more. So a lot of our, our slicing or our beefsteak type tomatoes, um, you tend to see this a lot more. And some of our heirloom varieties, um, you see it quite a bit too. So a lot of times it's just kind of a variety thing. Um, again, doesn't necessarily affect the quality, um, depending on how bad it is. It's just kind of unsightly a lot of times. Um, yellow shoulder, uh, so we get these hard yellow areas near the stem end of the plant, um, so that, that kind of that top doesn't really fully um, ripen. The internal tissue, so when we cut it open, you can see on the bottom there, um, it's still kind of white uh, and hard. Um, so a lot of times we see this um, with plants that are growing in soils with low potassium levels and have low organic matter and a high pH. So again, um, doing a soil test and seeing um, what these different levels are like. Um, could be the issue for you. Or if we have real high temperatures, so above 90 degrees, um, fruit that are exposed to the sun, um, a lot of times um, you'll see this as well. So, you know, in Illinois, during the summers, you know, July, August, we can get rather warm. Um, and if it's, if it's because of high temperatures, there's really not much um, you can do about that. Just kind of wait for cooler temperatures and kinda, your later tomatoes hopefully doesn't show up as much. Um, but it, kind of reducing that exposure to the sun um, can help. Um, cracking and rain checks, so you get this rapid fruit growth. So basically the kind of the, the fruit is growing faster than the skin can. Um, you start getting these, these cracking um, or that rain check, those little, um, little kind of lines, little scars on that fruit um, will develop. Um, again, if you're exposed to hot sun, they tend to crack more um, than if they're shaded properly. Um, so again, um, variety choice. Again, some varieties are just more um, prone than other. Uh, providing that even water supply. So if your plants get real dry, all of a sudden they get a lot of water, they may start growing real rapidly. So you have that nice consistent soil moisture. You kind of reduce the amount of that, the, the big flush of growth for the fruit. Again, having that healthy foliage uh, to shade the fruits so they're not getting too hot. Um, and if it is an issue, um, you can try to harvest your fruit before it completely ripe. Uh, and then ripen those inside to help reduce um, some of the incidence of this. Um, wildlife, um, typically birds, squirrels, stuff like that. Uh, typically you start seeing their damage just as the fruit begins to ripen. So you go out, you know, you think, oh, I've got another day or two before this tomato is ready to pick. You go out a day or two later and the birds and squirrels have gotten to it before you have. Uh, typically squirrels eat kind of a few bites, then they'll discard the tomato and then move on to another one. So that top picture there. Um, bird damage a lot of times um, looks like the, the, the fruit's been stabbed um, by their beaks. They just kind of peck at it. Um, a lot of times they may be, they may be trying to get the moisture from there. They may be hungry. A variety of different reasons they can be doing this. Um, so if, if you wanted to go the route of putting netting over your plants to protect your fruit, um, you can try that. Maybe try providing alternative food sources or water sources for them so they're leaving your plants alone. Uh, personally, in my garden, I had a lot of issues with squirrels last year. I got to the point I was taking um, plastic shopping bags and tying those around the fruit clusters to try to keep them off of there. Problem is that water gets in there and you get that real nice, wet, moist environment and you get all kinds of fungal growth on your fruit. So. I don't really have a good answer as to how to keep them off of there, but that is a, a common problem you may encounter when growing uh, tomatoes. Um, failure to ripen. Sometimes we get fruit and they just don't ripen for whatever reason. Uh, some issues, some things that can cause that are temperatures below 60 degrees or above 90 degrees. Um, so tomatoes can be kind of finicky with temperatures. They kind of need that little, that Goldilocks zone, that just right temperature. Uh, so we get too hot. Um, a lot of times we'll get in the summer. Um, it gets too hot and they just don't, fruit just won't ripen. Um, compacted soil, so you don't have real good root growth or soil is overly wet a lot of times, um, can cause fruit not to ripen. Again, those low potassium levels um, can inhibit fruit growth. 
Um, but you may want to be careful when putting potassium down because you get too much. Um, you reduce the amount of calcium and magnesium that's absorbed so or taken up. So you got to kind of get that fine balance there. So again, that soil testing um, is important. Um, and then normal for the cultivar. So knowing what your tomato is supposed to look like, maybe the tomato you picked kind of stays green. It doesn't really turn colors or it only turns yellow. It doesn't turn red. So knowing what your tomatoes are supposed to look like when they're ripe um, will help too. Um, no fruit. So sometimes we grow our tomato plants, we get these big, nice green, lush plants, but we have uh, no fruit on them. Uh, so tomatoes are, are plants that have those perfect flowers. So they're self-pollinating. They have both male and female uh, parts on the flowers. Um, so they can self-pollinate, but they need some sort of movement in order for that pollen to be released, whether that be um, wind, um, something like a bumblebee coming up and doing that that buzz pollination, vibrating it to release that pollen. They need some kind of movement to release that pollen. Um, temperatures um, can be an issue. So if night temperatures get above 72 degrees, um, the plants don't really produce pollen. So if you get real warm nights, the pollen production is reduced, less chance your, your flowers are gonna get pollinated and uh, produce fruit. Continuous day temperatures above 85 degrees, um, night temperatures above 72 degrees, plant will start dropping flowers. Um, and the night temperatures below 55 degrees can also cause those blossoms to drop. So again, kind of got to get that right temperature range there um, to get this fruit development. So if we get real hot during the summer, that may be why um, you're not seeing a lot of tomatoes. A lot of times early part of the, the summer, kind of get a lot of fruit. The things kind of wane a little bit until we get into late summer, early fall, and then production picks up a lot will pick up because the temperatures start cooling off. Um, and then humidity can also be a factor. So if humidity is below 40%, um, but above 70%, um, you may not get proper um, fertilization. So a lot of these are more environmental factors that we really can't control, but some reasons why you may not be getting fruit on your tomato plants. Um, so that's, all I've got for you today is so just kind of a kind of quick overview of some of the issues that we have and, and some of the ways you can address those. Um, so if you have questions you think of later, here's my contact information. Feel free to um, send me an email um, and I will do my best to answer your questions. Um, like Jamie mentioned, um, this is being recorded and we will post this to our um, University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube page. Um, you can also go there and find past recordings of Four Seasons. Um, gardening presentations as well on a variety of different topics.